Hello everyone, how are you? How's it going? Is this how you imagined it to be since the lockdown uh, was first announced at the end of March? I know it's been uh, lifted, but how things are today, is it how you imagined it would be? How are your um, patience levels? Yeah, not easy, is it? Well, there's a chap called John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. It's the last book in the Bible. And he says this in chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In John's setting of the scene, he describes three things that are ours in Christ. Suffering, kingdom and patient endurance. Now, I don't know about you, but I was thinking, is that, is that really what I signed up for here? Well, it is. Those three things. And we are companions with John in those things. We are companions together, you and I, in those three things. Patient endurance. Well, it's sometimes known as long-suffering. And it is ours through Christ. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Patience. God's patience with us, with the world. God's patience in terms of his character. And his patience in and through us. What does that look like? Well, um, I think to begin with, uh, we'll look at God. That's a good start, isn't it? He is the one who is patient. Is he? Well, is he patient? Does he experience long suffering? And uh, if you listen to one of my messages uh, last week, it was about sovereign God. So if God is sovereign, he can do what he wants to do and choose what he wants to choose. And it is up to him. Why would he choose long suffering? Why would he choose patience? That word used for patience in the in the New Testament, in particular, is interchangeable with uh, that um, those words "long suffering." The two are mean the same thing in the Greek. Uh, and why why would God choose that? So I think to help answer that question, we need to well we need to go right back to the beginning, don't we? Right back to the creation story. So let's let's do that. Uh, and maybe we need to go back a bit before. So there's God at the beginning. The triune, perfect, holy God. And he decides to create. So the earth, sun, moon and stars came into being. Day and night began and plants came into existence on his say-so. The earth was then teeming with animals of various sorts. Some of which we don't even see these days. And then God said in Genesis, verse one, uh, um, chapter 1, verse 26, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God did, and he saw that all he made was good. So as you know, he decided to put a couple of trees in that beautiful place, from which Adam and Eve were not allowed to eat. And why did he do that? Why did he do all this stuff and then do that? Well, this, this is the moment that free will came into existence. Of course, you know what happened with that. They disobeyed God and got thrown out of the garden and sin was birthed. Now, I, I've been asked uh, a number of times over the years, um, why didn't God stop it then? Why did he wait for 
you know, humans to multiply and then wipe out more of them? I, I don't have a clear answer to that. And he could have stopped it. He could have wiped the earth clean like a, you know, like a whiteboard and then started again. But he didn't. One thing I do know, though, is God wants a people that choose to love him, choose to worship him and respond to him as their Lord, King and Father. We're not supposed to be robots or be obliging, I suppose, in our faith. No, it's it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's an act of love. Uh, do you love God? Do I love God? God wants people to choose that for themselves. And the narrative of sin continued alongside God's desire for relationship with his people. God enabled a way to him through the law of Moses, part of which involved atonement for sins known and unknown through the, um, the, the sacrificial system. But as sin's story continued, the people thought they could literally get away with murder. You know, if they just sacrificed the right animal afterwards to cover it up. So it kind of worked like, you know, if you did something wrong, you could then go to the priest, offer a sacrifice and your sin would be atoned for. And so the people were choosing to do the wrong things, treating each other badly, just so they and then taking some stuff to be sacrificed some animals and to think that everything was be OK. But God is not fooled. He is holy and perfect in every way. And so the system fell down, it fell apart. Why? Because of sin. Because we are proud and greedy and corrupt. So again, why didn't God just get fed up and decide to wipe everyone out and start again? Because he's patient. He is patient. And then he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. He stepped down from his heavenly position to reveal the Father to us. Jesus showed us what a godly life looks like and then became the sacrifice. The sacrifice itself to cover all sin once and for all. And for us to enter into that, we just need to acknowledge our position before the Holy God. It says this in Romans 10 verse 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I mean, if you're watching this today and you're not saved, you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a Christian or whatever, then think about that. Why? Why is it? You don't follow this God who himself is love and is so patient with you. And you can. You can declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You can believe in your heart. I mean, this is really believe. It's not just a, a head thing, it's a heart thing. Do you believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Do you believe that? And if so, you will be saved. And you think, oh, it can't be that simple. Surely it's not that simple, Dave. Don't we have to follow a particular... This is laid out for us in the word of God itself. It's the simplicity that God laid out for us. So what has this to do with God being patient? Well, sin is at work in this world and actually still in and through me and you. In contrast, God is holy. He is perfect in every way. And because of that, we actually deserve to be wiped out. We do, because of his holiness. But because of his great love, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The godly for the ungodly. And so the reason why God doesn't just wipe us all out, which he has every right to do, is because he is so patient with you and with me and the rest of the world. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says, 
do not forget this one thing, dear friends. So this is Peter, you know, he's he's writing about the end times and the last days. And he's saying in all of that, don't forget this one thing. This is the important thing. With the day, oh, I was being so dramatic and now just messed up. It's good to be your patient with me. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So it's his enduring patience that caused him to make a way that worked by defeating death and hell and sin and Satan through Christ's death on the cross. But more than that, he has also given us life and life to the full through Christ's resurrection. His patience and endurance, his long suffering enabled our salvation. That's right. We are saved because he's patient with us and his patience desires that actually all are saved. And what does that look like in us, this godly patience? What does that look like in us? You see, it's difficult to lose your rag, isn't it, at this time when people are behaving in ways that they, I don't know, that isn't good, like in, in shops, in queuing, in waiting, in this strange world we're living. And God gives us the strength to to hang in there, to, as it says in Ephesians 6, to stand after all else has been done. Our troubles are real and present, but there is a day coming when they will be completely done away with. Let's look to God's patience as we draw the strength we need from him for ourselves to be patient in these times. Now, following uh, this today, I've chosen a song, which will hopefully be uplifting for you. And it starts with these lyrics. Waiting for you, be my rescue. Find me and bring me out alive. I will surrender. Let's surrender ourselves afresh to our patient Heavenly Father this day. Oh, and please be patient with this song as well, if you don't know it. It builds up to a fantastic ending. Bye for now.